Hello health champions, welcome back to another episode of The Taboo Doctor. On today's episode, I'm joined by Dr. Wumi of Shake Africa. Welcome to the episode. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm so glad to have you on because I've been stalking you on Instagram and, you know, seeing all your posts on there about all the amazing stuff that you're doing, raising awareness um, for female health in Africa. So can you tell us a lot about yourself and then how you came about getting onto the, the work that you're doing with Shake? Sure. Well, firstly, thank you for having me. And I've also been stalking you too. So <laughs> it's fine. Um, so my name is Wumi. I am a junior doctor working in Watford. And um, I have a real interest in sexual and reproductive health. It's something that I've loved for a very, very, very long time. Um, and I think that it's something that's often overlooked mm -hmm. and that's how um shake africa came about so throughout my medical school experience i've always volunteered um with sexual and reproductive health organizations in the uk but the one thing is you know being of nigerian descent the one thing i've always thought about is well what's happening in my country yeah. um and sort of looking I realized that not a lot was happening in the way of uh, meeting uh, young people's mm -hmm. sexual and reproductive health needs um, and so I decided one day that Shake Africa needed to be born and here we are. <laughs> and so was it just was it really that random or was it something that you feel had been building up because it sounds like you've always had this interest in terms of um, the reproduction of women did someone encourage you to start it off or did you just decide that actually you know you were going to just go ahead and do it yourself I think it was a kind of a bit of both in that mm -hmm. I always knew I wanted to do something I just didn't know what mm -hmm. but having volunteered like I was volunteering with an organization at the time yeah. um, and it just kind of one day I just felt like this would be great mm -hmm. in Nigeria and hearing people's experiences I was like this is, we have these experiences in Nigeria and I was just people aren't talking about it yeah so that, that's really where it came from that's great and so what's it been like since starting and what kind of projects are you doing and what is sort of your future plan and your future goal to get more people involved and get that message out there so since starting it's, it's been a really great time actually a really steep learning curve um I don't know who told me to try and do it in the final year of medical school but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's a bit. That's a busy time to do anything. <laughs> I don't know what came over me, um, but it's been great. Um, so it started off as a one man project, and now we have a really great team of ten people, ten wow. volunteers in Nigeria, um, which is really nice. Um, and currently what we've been doing is mostly trying to build our online profile. We have a website, which is our information hub. So if you're looking for information about sexual health, about like the STIs, for example, or contraception, you can find it all there. And then through our social media as well, um, we just try and, you know, push the boundaries a little bit in terms of the things that we're talking about um, and trying to answer the big questions that maybe people are a little bit more afraid to answer mm -hmm. um, or to ask. And um, in terms of our projects, what we're trying to do, uh, COVID permitting <laughs> is <laughs> a bit more outreach, yeah. uh, trying to get into schools um, and trying to access really young people uh, when they're starting to transition. And especially with, within Nigeria, where people can go to university a lot younger, I think the need is a lot higher to get yeah. to access them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And so when Dr. Wumi is not saving Nigeria's sexual you know, sexual youth and working uh, her shifts. What What do you do during your free time to unwind? I watch a lot of shows, <laughs> a lot, a lot of shows. I'm a real homebody, so I love yeah. watching shows. I love it. Um, so that's a, that's a lot of what I do. Um, and I really enjoy walking as well. So um, it's something I've really incorporated into my time, just spending time walking. Otherwise, you'll see me eating brunch dinner lunch or if you anybody wants to make me food I'm there as well. <laughs> that is awesome and what should our health champions be watching so what have you been watching that you want to recommend to our viewers what would I recommend I would say um okay so there's a series on Netflix I think everybody like, knows about it but it's called sex education and it is amazing because it's all things fun and it's educational so I would say people should definitely be watching that um if we're not talking sex ed and we're talking just in general life yeah. then everybody get on Amazon and watch this is us <laughs> 
<laughs> that is awesome. That is great. Those are two really good shows. Um, I think, yeah, worldwide, everyone's really been enjoying it. And talking about sex ed, it, it brings us into our topic for today. Um, and it relates really well with the work that you're doing with Shake. Um, and we, you know, we wanted to talk about access to contraception in Nigeria and also female genital mutilation as well which does happen in Nigeria um, and in quite a lot of other parts of Africa and in the Middle East. But before we jump into that, can you tell us about what it's been like trying to get the youth in Nigeria to learn more about their sexuality, the contraception, female health, just because there's a lot of cultural barriers that prevent Nigerian youth from accessing correct information um, and there's this pervasive mentality that you must be abstinent until you get married. And obviously, we know that Nigerian youth are not necessarily staying abstinent until they get married. So there's this gap in terms of the safety that is so necessary while they are in, in that position. And, you know, one of our initial episodes when we launched the podcast in November last year was done in Nigeria. And we had a panel discussion about contraception in Nigeria and they were talking about how it was so difficult because if you went into a family planning clinic as a young woman with no ring and no wedding certificate, the matrons would be like, oh no, if you take contraception, it's going to prevent you from being able to have babies when you finally get married. And so these barriers are there even in the places where you're supposed to be getting the right kind of information. So what's it been like for you starting this, this project, especially targeting the younger generation? Um, the really great question because it's it is kind of riddled with barriers in terms, and a lot of it does come from yeah. um, the cultural barriers and and the taboo, like sort of the fact that it is taboo. Mm-hmm. Um, sexual health is taboo. Yeah. Um, and I think one of the big things is that young people are quite scared to talk about it, or they feel there is still a lot of shame, and I think it's almost a it's almost a surprising level of shame I think when you kind of think about young people as being carefree and you know that's a time in your life where you sort of are doing things a little bit you're, you're not thinking as much yeah. um, about what you're doing and you're kind of living life um, and so I think that's really been something that I've been surprised by um, one of the things actually it's it's interesting when you speak with young people um and you say you know you're trying to get people to engage with shake africa and what we do and they'll say things like um you know well my salvation i really you know well i'll I'll talk i'll tell i'll tell some people about the organization but you know i don't really want to play with my salvation and then you're saying well this is we're not this we're not talking about it's not about religion in the sense that we're not um trying to change your religious views we're not even saying don't be abstinent and um, we're just trying to say that if you're not abstinent or if you're trying to or if you are um or if you're thinking even if you're just you are abstinent but you're you have friends who are not or you're thinking yeah. about how to navigate your sexual and reproductive health it's just important things to know and even if you wait till you're married these things don't go away you don't because you're married yeah. you know? that have um sexually transmitted infections you don't you know people do need contraception within marriage so that's been a big thing and I think also trying to engage with um older people within the community as well and trying to get them on board and to support the idea without them thinking that we're promoting um or we're trying to project or um personal ideas and agendas on other people and trying to force them into doing things that uh, they don't necessarily want to do or that the the society doesn't agree with um and it's you know so a big challenge has been trying to say we're not here trying to tell people how to live their lives in terms of when they uh, decide they will have sex or not but we're here to try and tell people if you are having sex or if you're thinking about it these are the steps you should take these are the things you need to consider so i think those are two uh, major barriers um and just also a lot of people think they know more in terms of the facts about sexual health than they do and um those ideas and these myths are kind of being pushed around a lot even amongst people that are 
sometimes you have people who are providing these services so like you said you'll go into a clinic in Nigeria and they'll tell you that it will cause infertility and you're thinking well this is a this is a healthcare professional they know what they're talking about and you take that home and then you tell everybody and all of a sudden you've got high rates of pregnancy because nobody wants to use any um, contraception and then what ends up happening is you have unsafe abortions yeah then can affect fertility yeah and they'll also ultimately put it down to the contraception yeah yeah that and that that is the cycle isn't it in terms of not being able to access contraception but really really not wanting to get pregnant at all and then a woman finds herself in that situation and she goes for the unsafe abortion as opposed to having had an implant put in that would have you know given her three years of no pregnancy um and so these kind of issues are definitely very pervasive in in our society and have you found any good ways of conveying that to the older generation to say actually educating people about something is not about giving them license to do anything it isn't um pushing them on one of the episodes um in this series we had Tamara come on and she was talking about how if a, a young lady has come to you to ask for contraception that means she's not planning on being abstinent and so you then telling her to be abstinent at that point is not necessarily um, is not necessarily effective um, counsel or whatever. You should probably have taught her about her abstinence way before she then decided that she wanted to get to, to, to start having a sexual um, relationship. And by the time she even comes to you, sometimes she's already having a sexual relationship and just wants to make sure that she's safe um, and and avoiding pregnancy. What do you say to people who think um, education is also the same as license? I say, do you know what? I, I One great thing is sometimes you have to hit people with the facts and the figures. Mm. And there are studies and there are reports <clears throat> that do say that actually by promoting sexual health education and having comprehensive sex education, mm. it actually deters people. Uh, and it actually um, means that when people do actually enter into these sexual relationships, they do it at a time when they're more comfortable and a time that they're less likely to deal with any sort of consequences so be that pregnancy be that um sexually transmitted infections um i think also just allowing them to feel like they can be a part of the conversation mm. um and trying to make sure that you know i think sometimes when knowledge can sometimes make you you might sometimes in the way that you convey your message almost be a little bit like well i don't know why you don't know this to the older generation mm. but at the same time, we can't blame them because that's what they were taught mm -hmm. so trying to open yourselves up and being more like you know let's all learn together or let's all discuss it what are your problems what are your issues what are your questions and why do you think this where did this come from yeah and I think that actually they're very amenable to that because oftentimes and you know they can come back and say like I've had um at events I've had debates with parents who are like you know my kids who cannot know my kids and actually you know when you speak to them and you peel back the layers, eventually they're like, you know what? Yes, actually. Yeah. If it means that my child is more equipped um, with the tools that they need to be able to navigate the world, then yes, I will. I think also a lot of it comes from a place of fear. Mm. And, um, you know, naturally parents will worry, adults will worry. And because they've been taught in a certain way, they sort of think they need to teach in that certain way. Um, so I think being open with them and allowing them the space to say, to, to kind of put forward their ideas, not shutting them down, because if we shut them down, we actually don't know what's going on, what's going on. And then we can't change or at least try and promote change in them. So I think that's really um, important. And in terms of schools, um, you know, I don't, I see, I see no reason why parents cannot, come in and have conversations with teachers for example mm. um and express their concerns in that way as well so I think that's really important for the older generation yeah definitely absolutely and so going forward then what is the that landscape like and what do you think we can do to then try to push and increase accessibility to 
safe contraception or just making sure that contraception is accessible or that STI screening is accessible um, for, for you know for, for members of the of the of the public in Nigeria without feeling as though especially for women without feeling as though oh, I must come in with my wedding ring or a fake wedding ring in some situations which some women which some women use um, you know to go into the because you know some of the family planning clinics in Lagos are free and um provided by the government and so some women go in with fake wedding rings um as oh yeah well i want to coil and i don't want anyone to ask me too many questions you know because i'm putting something into my body for the next five to ten years um so what do you say about then trying to make it easier for that population of people who don't have that masculine protection to actually go and say no you know she's single and she doesn't have a, a stable relationship but she does she doesn't want to get pregnant and she's having sex um, can we make it available to her as well? Um, first of all, this is just actually really funny because one of our volunteers um, in, went to Nigeria and was like, so we had a plan of go in and see how easy it is just to buy contraception. She so just go oh. into a pharmacy mm-hmm. and um, buy condoms. Yeah. And the whole time she's like messaging me, well, I'm really scared. I can't do this. I can't do this. Oh. She in. She's like, okay, I'm going to try. She says, she walks to the sexual health section. She sees the security guard looking at her with some kind of, like, what are you doing there? She mm-hmm. just her and left. And I think that's the thing. Like, even as people who are running an organization about this, even we feel some kind of way about going into these places and trying to acquire contraception and things like that. So the problem really is there. Um, I would say in terms of trying to make it accessible, it really is talking about it that's Mm -hmm. the first thing we need to do um if we're not talking about it then it's still this sort of secret oh you know oh my gosh like we can't Mm -hmm. people don't know that we're doing this and the problem with that is that you know then young people think it's something to be ashamed of it kind of um affirms like other the, the older generations and even the young generations who believe that it's something to be ashamed of it kind of tells them yes it is it reinforces that idea so um I think the more people that come out the more organizations that come out you know there are some really great people online on on Instagram you know for example there's a Laurie Coyter she's just saying she's just amazing yeah. she's really broken down those barriers yeah we actually interviewed her last week so her episode is right before yours yeah, yeah amazing so you see like people like her having her speak about it I think that's number one number two there's a real need to go back to training all the healthcare providers um that are providing these services and um you know trying to it's important to let them separate sort of not completely separate I don't think it's fair to make people completely separate their personal beliefs and their work but understanding that people's life decisions we can't concern ourselves with everyone's life decisions so but we're here as healthcare professionals to provide a particular service and do what's in the best interest for the people that we are serving Mm -hmm. and so training people up to understand a little bit more about that understand contraception better um and help them with these ideas that they've got that you know for example about infertility and making them more aware about aware of these things i think is really important Um, and there are some schemes here that I think we could benefit from in Nigeria at some point. So here there's the C-card scheme where young people can get their contraception just by literally presenting a card and then they get their contraception in a nice little bag and they go away. Um, and I think that that is great because it takes away um, that feeling. I think there will always, for a long time at least, there will always be a little bit of that feeling of, oh, you know, um, I'm a bit embarrassed to go in. And I, I think that's not always necessarily just because there's, I think it's because of shame around sex, but I think there are some, naturally some people feel that way, which is fine, but we need to accommodate them as well. So discrete packaging. um, And there are online services as well that are emerging. And once we have like a really great system in Nigeria, the system here of being able to order your um, test online, send it to a lab, get your, um, uh, you know, your treatment if needed in a pharmacy again just in a bag I think those things would go a really long way 
in trying to improve people's access. Within. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And you know, that um, example that you gave about the young lady going in to try to get condoms, I actually did that in, um, in Lagos uh, in November. So it wasn't for condoms, it was for the combined pill. Um, and so I, I went along with my friend and I was like, you know what, I'm going to test this thing out and just to see what it's like. And I think the issue was I actually went to, I probably went to the wrong place because it was in a built up area in a very um, privileged area of Lagos. And so a lot of the people that work in that area are actually investment bankers and, you know, so quite modern lady. So when I walked in, she was like, okay, which do you want? This, 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 or this? Um, what are you on? Um, have you had sex in the last couple of days? Blah, blah, blah. Any medical conditions? And she just gave it to me and that was it. And so, I mean, she was very matter of fact. Like, yeah. I wasn't expecting that at all. And obviously, like, the men around were kind of giving us a look. <laughs> but because I'd gone in with a friend and we were testing this thing out, it was a bit more comfortable. But yeah. The, but the pharmacist that we actually encountered was completely blasé about it. And I think, and that was really great. And I was really impressed. And I thought, huh, if I'd gone to a different pharmacy, maybe in a less cosmopolitan part of Lagos, what would the experience have been like? Very different. <laughs> <laughs> very, very different. Yeah. And I think that is very significant in terms of the health inequities that exist all around the world in terms of areas that are more urban compared to areas that are rural where people have access to information and then on the other side they perhaps don't have access to information and don't have access to good health care um, services and good health care providers and that brings us into talking about FGM because it's something that is still ongoing and in as much as we talk about it a bit more now so you know there's so much information about it you know the WHO um, has put it up and it's you know it is a violation of human rights now but it's still an ongoing issue so let's talk about female genital mutilation what exactly is it how does it affect women because you know there's so many ways that it does it does affect women and how can we then start talking about why it really needs to stop and changing the mindsets of those that carry out these assaults basically to, to the bodies of women and young children So um, female genital mutilation is really um, it's one of those topics that I am really invested in because mm -hmm. I think that, again, it's one of those hush-hush, uh, some people really don't think it's happening yeah. and it's happening a lot more than we think. Mm -hmm. um, or people think it's a thing of the past or it's only happening in particular countries yeah. and you'd be surprised that it's happening all over, mm -hmm. um, even if a lot of us are not aware of it. So... Um, Female genital mutilation, um, it, you know, we're talking about um, the, we'll say in, it's simply just cutting of women's genitals, although it's not actually um, quite as simple as that. There are different, there are different types of female genital mutilation. So we've got four types um, and they range from um, clitoridectomy. So just removing the uh, clitoris um, to removing the clitoris, the labia majora, minora, and sewing up um, the entire part. So that's called infant depilation. And then when we come up to type four, that's anything else that doesn't fall within what types one, two, and three. So that can be, um, for example, piercing. Um, and with female genital mutilation, there are different names for it um, with different communities, uh, which is sometimes part of the problem. So um, oftentimes it'll be called female circumcision. And then, um, you know, that begins to normalize it a little bit. And people are like, oh, well, it's just like, well, men, men get men are circumcised. Um, so, you know, it's the same thing. Um, but the, the thing about female genital mutilation is that there is no benefit to it. Um, and that is the that is the problem. There's no benefit with and it's got a lot of um, associated problems. So um, the problems are just uh, vast. So whether that is psychological um, damage. So under, if we understand the fact that most people will undergo a female genital mutilation by the time that they're 15, um, most times though they're, they're very, very young and it's not done with their consent. So uh, a lot of the times they'll be restrained and this is how um, it, they'll, they'll undergo it. And it's a very distressing time. So um, that's really big, the psychological impact and it affects them sexually as well later on. Um, because that is a type of sexual trauma and you know um often they might find that 
sex might be painful they might suffer from things like vaginismus um and then also if you think about the fact that there are just a higher rates of high rates of infection um and what that you know what that means in terms of um when now when people start having sex and it just increases their likelihoods of contracting um, different infections as well um, and then on top of that we've also got uh, problems around uh, pregnancy so particularly with things like infant debulation what you'll find is then when a um, when it's time for a woman to give birth um, that area is sewn up and so you then have to you know you have to open it up essentially um, and that comes with its risk that comes with its difficulties and then it's also putting um, them through another type of procedure again um, and you know I, I've seen women who are even are, like they've had no problems for a while and then all of a sudden they've got a lot of soreness a lot of redness they can't engage in sexual intercourse um, um, and the thing with FGM as well is that you know I said it happens before the age of 15 but that is just sort of an arbitrary number like it does happen well into people into adulthood and sometimes it can happen following marriage so husbands might say their their, their wives are not um what they expected and then they're subjected to further female genital mutilation at um, an older age which is obviously very traumatic um and then problems another thing as well that people forget people don't tend to realize it's for example things where it has been sewn up um they leave a little hole for menstruation, but sometimes that hole's not enough. And the menstrual, um, the, you know, menstruation will, will build up. Um, and that can, there have been women who have lost their reproductive organs because they have had so much men um, period build up within them. And it has caused um, essentially their reproductive organs to disintegrate. So there are so many, so many risks. It's not something to take lightly at all, at all, at all. Yeah. And, you know, you said something um, about men in in this in this setting, and I think we'll probably talk about the way different genders also view view FGM in different ways. But there's this idea that if you cut a woman, which some some communities call it as well, that she will not be promiscuous, and it's this kind of it's this kind of thing of saying first of all what exactly is promiscuity um which is probably an entirely different episode but what exactly is that and also um how do we get people to understand that cutting somebody and and their sexual activities don't don't necessarily relate relate to each other and one one is not a cause for the other i think there's such a there's so much focus on promiscuity, um, which I find really funny because the question is really what is promiscuity? Mm -hmm. There is no blanket definition for promiscuity. Um, does promiscuity even exist? It is what yeah. is your own interpretation of it? It's so subjective, isn't exactly. it? Exactly. So, you know, is promiscuity looking at a, somebody of somebody else, somebody that you're sexually attracted to? Is that promiscuity? Is it how many people you sleep with? You know, I think there's there's too much focus on that word and that idea um and you know I'm not going to like force my ideas but in my in my mind promiscuity doesn't exist um because I think that there's just too much judgment around the this word of promiscuity and actually we you know there's sex, sex and sexual behaviors are multifaceted and they have there are many things that contribute to why a person operates the way that they do sexually so um I think that's you know really important for people to understand um and in terms of you know how we get people to understand that promiscuity um promiscuity um can't be you can't sort of stop someone from being promiscuous from um fgm and things like that i think you know it comes down to that understanding of sexuality um sex and then also gender norms as well we're not talking about how do we prevent how to prevent men from being promiscuous um you know and this comes again and now it's talking about a woman's place in society the way that we're viewed the mm -hmm. fact that we're not just a vessel for a man's sexual pleasure um the fact that we're not um that, that we're not just here to be sort of um a kind of a, a man's side piece to, to do mm -hmm. whatever he 
wants us to do yeah. and um it's all about the way that we are viewed as um be viewed by men yes. so will we be a desirable partner later mm -hmm. on in life that's why we don't want women to be promiscuous it's because we want men to be attracted to us we want to be taken as a wife mm -hmm. um, and one thing you know i think i like to say is that if if i'm marrying somebody you you don't you're not you're not taking me i'm not lucky for you to to have me you're lucky to have you're lucky to have me i'm lucky to have you it's a it's it's a two-way thing and if you start to view relationships like that and start to view our interactions as actually we're all equal we all have um an important place then this whole um policing of women's bodies and what we do with them and you know how a woman dresses how she looks I think um those things will start to die down a little bit um and then this idea with FGM is that a lot of people actually believe it's in religious texts or it's you know it's mandated by religion it's not mandated by religion to to for women to, um, to undergo FGM and I think actually a lot of people are surprised by that when you sort of break it down to them like actually um, your religion doesn't say that mm -hmm. they were like oh wow like I really thought that this was part of my wow. religion but I think that's a really important thing um in helping people to understand that as well that actually religion doesn't mandate this yeah 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 definitely because I think also because male circumcision um has that word to it people then put it onto female female circumcision as well um and and sometimes as well, what, what I've actually seen um, is some women who have been caught as children, perhaps even as early as, you know, young boys would have been caught for circumcision, have been taught and raised that it is the norm to do that to both male and female children. And how do we then start having these conversations to people to say, this is something that was done to you and it was an assault to your body it was an assault to your sexual pleasure as well in the future because we know that the, the only function of the clitoris is pleasure. But what do you say to that to then start re-educating people that actually you have been assaulted? It's a, you know, that's a really difficult one because I've had that conversation mm -hmm. where I'm like, because it, you know, it's thrown in conversation sometimes so lightly that even you're like, yeah, you know, that's, and then you're like, wait, no, actually, this is not, um, it's not what it's not how things were meant to be done yeah. um so it is quite difficult because also it's always towing that line of not wanting to someone to feel attacked or judged yes. by, yeah. um, especially by something that they had no control over exactly. Um, exactly. and trying not to make them feel abnormal whatever abnormal means um but i think it's just explaining to them that you know you you're one of the lucky ones and mm -hmm. it's really fantastic that you've had no complications and mm -hmm. that's what we like to hear but actually um breaking it down to them that though though you've had no complications you've had no you've had no problems that's not the story for everybody mm -hmm. um and you know it's not the same as male circumcision um there are you know during male circumcision it's the foreskin that's removed and you know uh that you can argue that there are there are health benefits to that um with female circumcision or with female genital mutilation it is the remove the removal of the clitoris like you said the clitoris only has one function and actually the clitoris has double the nerve endings of the penis like yeah it is like you said clitoral power yeah um and trying to explain to them that actually because it only has that one function the only then one thing that female genital mutilation is there to do is to diminish that pleasure mm. and what you could have we will never know but what you may have experienced in terms of sexual pleasure prior to having um fgm it might be um a lot different um but we can't measure that but i just think it's important for people to understand that because they've had a good experience doesn't mean that everybody's had a good experience um and a lot of people that are speaking out now about their own experiences and their difficulties i think has been really helpful and yeah. useful um and people understanding that actually it's not it's not all fun and games in fact yeah. it's not fun and games it's at all really yeah definitely and i think there's there is a lot of shame with um, with FGM mm -hmm. and um, a lot of women as well who have been assaulted in that way mm -hmm. and are experiencing pain you know pain in urination 
pain during their um, monthly menstrual cycle, pain during sex. And because of that shame and because of the taboo related to it, they don't present. So they don't talk about it with their healthcare worker and they suffer in so much silence with that. What would you say to a woman in that situation who felt so much shame and stigma because of first what's been done to her, but then also the symptoms that she's been living with for such a long time? The first thing I'm going to say is, you know, what you said, you said two things when you were talking about it. You said assault and you said um, what was done to her. And I think that's really important for her to know and understand that you were assaulted and it was mm-hmm. something done to you. Yeah. And first of all, I'm sorry that that happened to you. But, you know, it's not it's not it's nothing for you to be ashamed of. Um, it's it's something that if anyone's to be ashamed of it's, it's unfortunately it's the people that do it to you and it's the society the society that continues to say that your body is not worth um all the things that it is worth um and just to understand that um fgm you know with all the things that come with it the the you know the painful urination you know, painful sex you don't have to live with that and that there is something we can do. Unfortunately, we can't go back and we can't take back the fact that you've undergone FGM, but what we can do moving forward is diminish, trying to reduce that pain for you. Um, Nobody should have to live in pain. Nobody should, nobody should have to live in silence. Nobody should have to suffer in silence. It's happening a lot more than you think. So many people that you speak to, you don't know that they've actually undergone FGM as well. Mm -hmm. Um, It's just that people are not walking around shouting it from the rooftops that it's happened to them, but it's happened. Mm -hmm. And, it happens so much that, like I said, people can drop it in conversation and, and you almost don't even realise that they've said it until later. You're like, oh, my gosh, you've actually undergone FGM. So I think it's important to just, you know, feel empowered, um, know that you're not alone. It's happening, uh, sadly, every day. Um, and because there's so many things we can do about it, come in, come into the doctors, go see your GP, go see your um, go to a sexual health clinic, go and see someone who knows about this and who can help you out and um, just don't feel like you have to suffer in silence. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And what do you say to a healthcare worker on the other side receiving that? Because I think now there's been a lot more talk about it, but mm-hmm. there are a lot of healthcare workers who still haven't encountered, you know, service users who have gone through that experience. And so sometimes even just understanding and the sensitivity around around it is also is also different. And also maybe also thinking about it in history taking when someone is present, especially a woman is presenting recurrently with certain kinds of symptoms, just thinking about it and saying, actually, could this perhaps be a situation? And how do we approach this question in in an appropriate way? A few, several episodes ago, we had Jade of All Births, who's uh, an amazing midwife here in London, and she was talking about how, you know, when she was in her training, sometimes she'd encounter women with FGM and some of the maternal units were not so equipped on, first of all, how to manage an FGM delivery and also how to manage the woman's own psychological concerns about going going into delivery. So what would you say to healthcare workers in that situation? I'll say it's our responsibility to educate ourselves more. I think it's our responsibility to learn about it. Um, Mm. I think it's not... um, I'm not trying to, I don't want to sound like it's righteous, self-righteous. I'm not going to pretend I know everything about FGM, but I think it's not, it's, it is on us mm-hmm. um, to make sure that we learn what we can do to, to um, make sure that everything that we do is in our patient's best interest. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's the first thing. I think also don't be scared. I think it's mm-hmm. quite an overwhelming thing. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's horrible for the people that have experienced it. Um, but I also think that people kind of feel a little bit of secondary trauma and they sort of look at it and they're like, oh my gosh, and they get flustered and don't know what to do. Um, and I think that the, the, the best thing that you can do for that woman in that, in that moment is to be calm and to just gather your thoughts. And if you don't know about it, I mean, I don't think it's possible for everyone to necessarily know about it, um, especially in this, this, the world that we live in currently. Um, take your time to learn more about it, to find out, take a moment. You don't have to rush into, um, into, you know, into treating or that consultation. Sometimes you'd be like, I'm sorry, I just need to take a minute and gather your thoughts and, and think a little bit more about it. Um, I do think that being said that there is a need and a hugely unmet need for this to be incorporated into people's training. 
yeah so medical school you know um it shouldn't just be something that you kind of come across in one multiple choice question and you're like okay this is it now I know FGM mm. it should be something that's actually taught properly um same with midwifery and nursing and all everything really um even you know psychologists as well they need to know how what what that is so I think that's really really um important in terms of people feeling more equipped and and to be able to deal with it and then I think you know just make sure you're putting your patient first which you should be doing anyway mm-hmm. um trying to understand what they're feeling and listening really trying to listen and hear mm-hmm what they're saying to you, what their concerns are, what their experiences are, because often actually in listening to that, they'll, they themselves will tell you what they need from you and how you can help them. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And actually, while you were talking, I was also thinking about, you know, so that is also sort of the clinical things. And as doctors and in healthcare, we we often think about, oh, yeah, okay, well, when it's time to have a baby, we'll do this. And, you know, we can put an alert on your notes and let your GP know and all of those things. But then sometimes we don't even think about, well, what about your sexual pleasure? And actually, what what is that like? And are you you in your relationship, regardless of who your partner is, are you actually having a fulfilling sexual life? Um, And and in some situations, some some people are not because they also feel that that is taboo. They can't talk about it. They can't ask questions about it. And even, you know, in women who have not been assaulted in any way, even just talking about it, is so difficult on on a you know on on that level. So what do you say to women who have been assaulted by FGM um, mm-hmm. about letting them know that it might not be the same, but it is still possible to still have a fulfilling sexual experience with your partner? I think the first thing I'll say is that this idea that sex is for men, it, it's just not. So mm-hmm. it's it's meant to be for both parties, um, and so for that reason, your sexual pleasure is just as important as the, as your partner's sexual pleasure, mm-hmm. and you need to prioritize that. You need to prioritize yourself. You should feel no shame talking about it. Um, and I know it sounds kind of like I'm. It's, I know it's easier said than done. It's it sounds like it's really easy to just be like, oh yeah, no, it's fine. Just go and talk about it. Um, but really, just go and talk about it. And I think once you kind of break that initial barrier of you know speaking about it, you actually will feel a lot better. And there is so much that can be done. But I think that you know the idea is okay like it's fine as long as he's having fun no you should have fun too that's basically you know point blank you need to have fun too you need to enjoy it too um your body is not just a vessel for a man's pleasure and so get to get to talking with whoever it is um and don't just don't don't feel shame this this, again it's nothing that you've done it's something that was done to you yeah definitely and what about young girls who are taken away so we do have that i mean probably not so much this year with COVID. Um, But, you know, over the past few years, we've had young girls who have been in school and they've been taken away by their parents on holiday um, and FGM's been done to them. They've been assaulted and then they've been brought back in. What do you say to girls in that situation who are perhaps suspicious that it might be a family pattern where maybe their parents don't know better? Yeah. Um, and you know some parents don't know better they don't realize that it is assault they think that it's a cultural thing or like you said as well some of them are misled and think that it is a religiously mandated thing which it isn't what do you then say to a young girl in that situation maybe listening to this podcast who thinks her time might be coming and her family might might take her away to do that I think if you're in a situation where you feel like this could happen to you um it's a difficult thing, but you just need to speak up. I think um, the unfortunate thing is it's not something that can be undone. So it's we the best thing we can do is try and intervene early. And it's not, you know, we're not saying just run to, you don't necessarily have to run to the police and say if that's not what you're comfortable about, but run to speak to somebody who is... Um, who you feel comfortable speaking with, if it's a, a teacher or um, a preferably an adult, somebody who would be able to advocate for you well. Um, but it's important to know that it is it is illegal. Um, and um, even if it's not done in the, this country, if you're taken away and brought back, it is illegal. Um, and so it's just but just by, by that, you know, it's not something that should be done. Um, also, you know, don't just it's a it's a scary experience but 
don't feel alone in it there are so many organizations out there so many people you can speak with um even if it, for example just there's an organization in the UK called Forwards UK um, and they do really great work around FGM they have a helpline you can get on type in Forwards UK into Google get onto their helpline speak with them speak with um, a member of staff at your school just speak with somebody that you're comfortable with but the, the important thing is just to speak up that's that's all you can do just also talking about that then in terms of then going into northern parts of Nigeria and um, other parts of Africa and a few parts, parts of the Middle East as well, where these things are then done in sort of commonplace and commonplace in villages where also there's no sterilization when they do these procedures. So people can have really bad infections, sepsis, or even further damage to further pel pelvic organs as well. How do we then start changing this, you know, because it's, it's all well and good talking about it in urban environments. And we're talking about it here in the UK where, you know, your rights are protected to quite a, a significant extent. But then for the, for the young women in, in northern parts of Nigeria or Sudan or Somalia or places, you know, in, in those smaller rural areas where, where it is being done, how, how can we get the message through do you think it is just simple political will or do you think that there's another way where NGOs can actually get involved so I think the the key is actually to integrate yourselves a little bit mm -hmm. and understanding the culture and understanding the their ideas and ideologies and what is making them tick and what's making them do these things the way that they're doing them um I do think it, you know even in ways that we don't necessarily want to we have to sort of adhere mm -hmm. so um one of the things when doing the volunteer recruitment process that came up and I actually really loved it was this idea that actually if you're dealing for example in the north you do need men on board who are going mm -hmm. to speak to men yeah and whilst that might not necessarily be something that I'm like gung-ho for I'm like oh, yeah I should be able to speak to a man too mm -hmm. we need to understand that this is the cultural the cultural cultural beliefs and we do need to, in order to get what we want sometimes you do kind of just need to kind of comply a little bit and understand okay this is their cultural way so I think that's really important it's getting more people on board getting more men on board getting more people who understand the culture on board as well um and like I said before it's about going into these communities without your judgment because the fact of the matter is these people are not necessarily malicious people, evil people who are just out there. To, that's not it. Like you said, they don't know any better. Mm -hmm. um, and so coming with that understanding of, okay, I understand that this is what you think, this is what you believe, but this is what I also believe. And engaging the religious leaders mm -hmm. um, is really important. I think having their backing really, really helps because people look very highly and favorably upon their religious leaders. Mm -hmm. And if they're saying, like, actually, guys, FGM is not the way to go or listen to this organization speak. I think that's great. I've seen sexual health organizations go into churches and speak with um, and speak in Sunday schools about sexual and reproductive health. And I think that that is really key, a really key way of us being able to um, infiltrate a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. That is amazing. And what about talking about it amongst ourselves to just reducing that stigma and talking more about it? Because you know, there's always, th th because it's so taboo, because everything genitals and sex is so taboo, people go through things alone. They go through it in isolation. Their friends don't know about it. Their family don't know about it. Or it's it has been their family that has assaulted them as well. Um, but in, even in their close friend groups, you know, the, the family that you create for yourself, which is basically your friends, sometimes we don't talk about these things amongst ourselves. What would you say to people to then try to get them to start opening up in those friendship groups so that, because what normally happens is sort of like a domino effect, isn't it? And someone says this thing and then someone is like, well, that didn't happen to me, but someone touched me when I was four or, or someone did this to me when I was 10 or, oh, well, it wasn't when I was a child, but when I was a, a junior doctor, a consultant did this and hugged me and I, I didn't know why he hugged me or someone groped me and so we all then start having these conversations how do you encourage that so that we can start bringing healing to the surface I think it's again it's kind of rooted in this feeling of shame and like mm. remembering you know that the problem is not you in the situation yeah. and 
um, you you know we sometimes absolve the perpetrators of responsibility by say by victim blaming and saying like oh you know you wore this you did this um you know you were a bit promiscuous or we thought you were looking at men so that's why you had to undergo fgm or that's why we breast dining happened mm -hmm. or whatever um i think we need to take away that shame first of all um and then just maybe start by someone you're comfortable with as well so you know don't feel like you have to do it at the party with like 10 of your girlfriends and then just it doesn't necessarily have to be like that but it, you know maybe start with the one friend um and you'll be surprised literally what you said it is a domino effect it's just one person says it and then everyone's like oh my gosh and then this happened to me and the person's like, no way and I think that that you'll find a lot of healing in that like you said um being able to share your experiences with other people and you you know you'll also find that they probably have solutions to things that mm -hmm. or things that you've not really thought about mm -hmm. um experiences are really great um teacher and a lot of people learn from their experiences and they can use that to help mm -hmm. so you'd also be surprised how much you might be helping somebody else mm -hmm. by saying like you know this has happened to me um uh, it's therapeutic for you but it also opens allows other people to feel like they've they can feel comfortable speaking about it um but again it just for me comes down to don't feel that shame it's it's not it's not you it's not what you've done contrary to what society is trying to tell you this is not your fault yeah thank you so much for that and just in rounding up what do you want our listeners to hold on to about their sexual health and you know their sexual safety in regard, regardless of what community they're in, wherever they are or who their partner is, what, what do you want them to hold on to? I just want them to remember that, you know, their sexual health, their sexual pleasure, their reproductive health, it's, it's, it's in their hands. And um, we all have the right to have fulfilling sexual um, um, experiences and lives. And so for that reason, um, don't feel scared of learning more about it, reading more about it, um, and speaking about it, um, you know, sexual and reproductive health rights, they're actually a thing. You have the right to that. So don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Um, yeah, and be feel empowered in your sexuality. Don't be ashamed by it. Um, you'll be surprised. People are doing all sorts and they'll tell you they're not doing anything. So yeah. like, live your life. <laughs> that is true. Live your life. I absolutely love that. And where can our listeners find you online? Well, guys, come to shakeafrica.org, www.shakeafrica.org if you want any information about sexual and reproductive health. We also have like our online chat services as well. So if you have any worries, anything you'd like to share, we're always there. Also, you can find us at, at Shake Africa on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, where we are always pushing the boundaries. So come along and have a look. That is fantastic. Thank you so much, Rumi, for joining us on Taboo Doctor today. Thank you so much for having me. I had a great time. It was great talking to you. Thank you.